Hello everyone, this is Leilani Coffin, the CEO of the Learning Council, news media and research organization, and also a proud Edu Jedi Grand Master. This is our 22nd Edu Jedi meeting, and we're going to be talking today about UI UX, user interface, user experience, uh, and the digital learning experience standards that go with those in the Edu Jedi Dictionary, and specifically focus our attention today on redirects and responsive design. Now, these are like big words for a lot of educators. They're like, what are you talking about? So part of our purpose here today is also to educate. As we do this recording for anyone who didn't attend and watches it later, which is normally thousands and thousands of people, we're here to let you know what is going on in this particular arena with some people who can talk about it and speculate on it and those kinds of things. So we have with us today Jennifer Lampkins uh, from uh, Northwest Association of Independent Schools. She's their coordinator of member and technology support services. Good friend of ours. We got to meet her on the road a couple years ago. Dr. Tina Barrios, also a good friend of ours, Assistant Superintendent, Information Systems and Technology from Polk County Public. And also from Central Indiana today is Melissa Bardak. And so we're going to have her introduce herself in a, in a second here. And then we also have Dr. Wendy Oliver, who's the Chief Learning Officer from Edison Learning. And um, Brady Bajusic, who's also with us from Edison Learning, they're our sponsors today, but more importantly, they get to um, filter in comments as we talk about this technical subject from that commercial grade, professional level of um, digital curriculum that they're building so people can sort of have a window into what's going on in that commercial side. So I want to start first with um, introduction by Wendy and Brady as to what's going on with Edison Learning to sort of help frame us out. And then I'm going to come back to Melissa and get kicked off here about this topic. So go ahead, Wendy. Thank you, Lanlani, for allowing us to participate and um, be involved in the discussion. I get to learn so much in these discussions and, and really get caught up on what's going on in the districts. Uh, Edison Learning has been around for about 20 years and um, we have approximately 150 online courses, um, but in addition to that, we also have an instructional services team where we have teachers that are certified in multiple courses and um, multiple states as well. And um, I think I said 20 years, but it's really almost 30 years. Um, time flies. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things about Edison Learning that I really love is that we have a variety of courses to include first time credit. Uh, we have recovery credit uh, for students. We also have project-based um, courses. So we have a lot to offer, and I'm really excited to show you some of those things today as we talk through some of the terms. Um, we talk about user experience. Uh, so I'll just hush there, and then we'll just um, interject as we go and hopefully be able to provide some visuals that will help with some of the things that we talk about. You're perfect. Um, yeah, so some of those will be like actually how things work for navigation and user experience in a prograde system that is not just a framework and includes the content. So, yeah, we'll get into that. Okay, so um, Melissa Bardak, let's introduce you and uh, your role and uh, give us a little background on what's happening for you guys in Indiana. Sure, I'm Melissa Bardak, Instructional Specialist at Indiana Online, a department of Central Indiana Educational Service Center. And we have recently started a full-time virtual academy um, called Indiana Online Academy for seventh through 12th grade students. And, and we are also a supplemental program for several different districts in Central Indiana to provide online courses to our partner districts. So my role is to work with staff and um, do that onboarding and the professional development for our virtual world. Okay. Um, excellent. So you're going to be able to talk a lot about what's going on in the software field. Uh, so let's just frame this out. So this activity is all about, you know, essentially using this EduJedi dictionary and the model and the standards that are in there to not be afraid of talking about the user interface and the user experience, which is still developing, obviously, in the professional world. But there's things like these, you know, what, what happens if you buy a system where if a, if a student hits a 404 error page, you know, those blank pages, 
The system isn't built with an automatic redirect, which should be standard for every type of software in K-12 because kids get lost really easy in, in navigation. So that's just one of the standards that we're going to talk about today. All right, so these are the standards, right, um, that we're talking about. It starts with you know, the fact that digital learning experience depends on the purchase discretion of that school or district for the system, app, service, and the fixed level, like they should have a contract with vendors, and vigilance by all users. But these standards um, are really just sort of helpful for the inspection of the digital learning, uh, ex you know, experience. So it starts with the site app or system menus list all options with fixed headers. Okay, so you don't lose your header when you're poking around on the page so you can find your way back out again. That's a, that's a serious issue. Um, and they're not buried in non sequitur subpages, right? So you don't know where to go to find your navigation. This can be a big problem in systems. So I want to start with that and maybe clump that together with the next couple of ones and talk about these, you know, from the perspective of what you're seeing and how systems are working. Great. So I think you're right. That first bullet of having that fixed header is extremely important for um, user ability and accessibility. Also in keeping students in the same general area of focus. Um, if there is a drop down menu that pops up, if the header's going away, it's really easy for the user to get lost with their instruction. I think the big one right now that we are experiencing the most is um, bullet B. The difference between mobile access and web-based access. There are a lot of intricate details that go in with moving something from a web-based web platform to a mobile platform. And if those are not aligned and fixed in a format that's going to be fluid for a mobile setting, it causes a lot of chaos. A lot of questions, a lot of chaos. Um, so for our end, we see bullet B being extremely important because a lot of people are working. Our users now are doing a lot on the go. So it may be from mm -hmm. an app or mobile device. Melissa, I yeah. add to that. Uh, I would just say a lot of people don't think, you know, when you say mobile device, a lot of people think phone, right? And that responsive design from the commercial grade side has to apply to an iPad too, especially when you're talking about younger students because a lot of districts are working off of iPads. And so when you code and you do that responsive design, you, you have to make the software work uh, on those devices as well. The other key point is making it look the same. The interface needs to have the same visuals that we're using in a web-based version as opposed to an app or mobile device. So there have been things, even on a MacBook, where it encourages you to download the app to run through iOS, and I'm on my laptop, which you may not think of as using a mobile device, but if you open an app through your laptop, it's going to run that app experience. So having a very streamlined flow and something that's really consistent from point A to point B, the more changes you make page to page to page or menu to menu, um, is not as user friendly. I got it. Um, I'm making notes just so you know, when you see me head down like this is because I'm writing. Um, to make sure I have everything down. And Jennifer joined us. Hi. Hi, I can see you now. I was having trouble seeing hi. you, but yeah, hi, good to have you. So let's start out with your introduction of what's happening for you and your district. Um, and then we can have you sort of weigh in on our first sort of conversation about all these standards. Well, I, you know, I come from a service piece of it uh, in terms of I work for the Northwest Association of Independent Schools. And so I work with about 125 schools, uh, independent private schools. And so there's a hodgepodge of you know, it's not under a district, and so there isn't that kind of district level technology. Every school is doing something that they believe is culturally significant in terms of their technology and culturally relevant. 
Um, and so it depends on the school and the the values of the school and the focus of their curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. So every school is a different entity. And with COVID, of course, they all, you know, there were some schools that weren't ready at all because they had no technology. And then there were some that were relatively new. We had one that was probably only three or four years old, maybe mm -hmm. two years old. And it was already in kind of a, it was at the time I was the tech director at that school. And so I had made a lot of changes in terms of mobile. Um, and I remember the year before COVID-19 sitting in a leadership meeting and going, what if we have a pandemic? You know, are we going to be ready? Um, what's going to happen if we have to close school for two weeks because of some sort of flu virus or something? And it was just weird because I left the school after that year to start this position. And because I had actually said to my head of school, what if you have to, you know, why, why wouldn't you just, you know, close for a year since it's coming up on your 100th anniversary, you have plenty of money in your you know, in your account to actually hold over for a year and do some significant professional development. This was a school that had 12% acceptance rate. I mean, it wasn't going to fall apart if it took six months to train teachers in mobile technologies and train teachers in, you know, at their 100th anniversary, how to address this. And so while I put in a lot of mobile displays and things like that, that actually interacted with students at home, um and it was you know it's just kind of this weird i didn't have any forecasting but i was just kind of in this future-based mindset that said you know anything could happen and how are we prepared for that and how are we going to be of service to our students in that future however it, whether it's dystopian or whether it's idealist you know it's how are we going to be ready for that? And so then coming to the Northwest Association of Independent Schools as a service, you know, I kind of went here to take a break <laughs> from being a director. And then COVID hit and our association became more in demand than it ever had before. And so working on a weekly basis, having meetings with tech directors who were fried, who were just needed some sort of support yeah for what they were doing. And so, you know, I was in meetings with them weekly. I ended up taking an interim position because of a director of tech who had to go out on a COVID slash maternity leave. And so, you know, that rest never happened. Um, but being with Northwest Associations, you know, of independent schools, I've had the opportunity to see how these things are addressed in multiple venues in multiple populations. You know, I've given Zoom talks to parents. I've, you know, done a DEI uh, presentation with a series of tech directors. And so, you know, coming from that, it's a different lens um, yeah. and a more spatial lens as to the issues. And so mm -hmm. I look at these UI design elements and I say, yes, and. Yes. Yeah, and it's okay for you to also, as we go along for this hour, talk about things just from the overall digital learning experience that you're seeing in all your schools. All right, so I see we've had Tina join us. Fantastic. Um, so good to have you. I'm Leilani again, and um, Learning Council is uh, delighted to see you, and I, I know we're taking a precious amount of time from you. So I, I, I'd like to maybe have you start like the other two had started, Give us a little overview of what's happening for you, and then we'll come back to this conversation about these issues. Okay, well, apologize for being late. I installed uh, some security stuff on my desktop, and it just went round and round and wouldn't connect. So it dawned on me, so I got my laptop out, and it worked. So there's something, some setting there that it doesn't like, <laughs> you know, as we move well, into the cyber security world that we're trying to, trying to deal with. Um, so, um, I've been at Polk for seven years. I spent 32 years at, in Manatee County and had quite a bit of experience in the early 2000s, mid 2000s with one-to-one -one implementation. So had some background um, 
and I've been at Polk County um, for the last seven years. And when the pandemic hit, it was a real challenge for us. We were not ready at all to pivot. We had we we had some one to one implementations in classrooms, one school really, but we didn't have the resources to send devices home. I mean, when it hit, and so um, there were there was a a lot of stress and a lot of a lot of work. Um, it was scary for me because I knew what it would take to pivot to that, and I knew at such a large district we weren't ready. And so we literally just had to pull up our bootstraps and figure out how to make this work. And we put teams together, and we had help desk with um, help desk set up with our network managers, and we had interpreters and curriculum specialists on rotating hours when we had to pivot completely. Um, and so we had to learn a lot pretty quickly. Um, we were a little bit better prepared in the fall um, as we moved forward. The, we had a lot of digital tools in place. Uh, we were using Google Classroom and Microsoft Office. We pivoted. We had been using Teams some, but that became something we learned very quickly, including administrators and, and you know, high-level meetings. Um, so that was an interesting transition. We did not have an LMS at the time um for the last quarter so that was something that uh last summer not this past summer we implemented a uh, schoology as our lms in about 13 weeks which you can imagine is a huge lift so <laughs> implementing and getting content in and we were about 50 percent e-learners um, for the first quarter last year so it was it was a huge undertaking, um, and one of the things I will say that's that but that's been interesting. While we are moving forward, we also have a new superintendent this year. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, transition at the cabinet level. But one of the things that's been interesting is that as we sort of started coming out of the pandemic and kids started coming back to school. A lot of teachers had in their mind that Schoology or LMS was just for COVID. Oh, yeah. So, so we're we're trying to move toward no. This is the new normal, and this will be sort of that learning platform. Um, and we're having a lot of conversations about you know extended learning and closing that homework gap. Um, we applied for quite a few devices for the emergency connectivity funds. So we're we're definitely pivoting and moving in that direction, but there's a lot of work on the teacher development side and even on the administrator side. Um, as far as you know, the UI, you're, you're right. I mean, there's 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 been some improvement there, um, but it's very different at the K five level versus middle and high school. So I think there's a lot of things to learn and understand um, from that perspective. Yeah, and this and then what and the sort of the conversation we have in front of you today is really a deep level conversation in terms of like that quality of the user interface. But you're right. If that's where you've been, you still have a lot of basics mm -hmm. that you have to do. And we're still hearing from what we thought were much more advanced districts saying, wow, the lift to get the teachers to realize normal's not coming back. Um, heavy, heavy. Yes. Um, Okay, so we started, so so back to you, Tina, just maybe any comments you want to make about the things I have on the screen right now. Um, you know, they're simple things, uh, like, a, you know, mobile responsive design or providing proper workflow routing and notification to users. Those are things that maybe a lot of your teachers don't understand, but since you've implemented Schoology, they're starting to get it, maybe. Yep. So, you know, what are you seeing in terms of the user experience for those teachers to really think with, I have to not just be concerned about like the physical classroom distribution of paper and stuff. I have to be concerned with, you know, students getting the right things and moving to the right places. And are they starting to at least sort of think with that? Um, yeah, we do have a single sign-on system, so it sort of at least directs them. We're using ClassLink, and so we have developed kind of that dashboard um, look and, and a standardization there, and that, that was very helpful because we did have that in place. Um, we're trying to navigate them. We're trying to really use a Schoology as kind of our landing 
page for learning and having most everything we can go through that interface because that was also one of the things we heard when we had to pivot was while we had a lot of resources and we had a dashboard that they were custom to parents were getting lost like i got i clicked on this link and it took me over here but i don't remember where i got that math assignment kind of thing so uh -huh. uh, the positive was we had a lot of resources the negative was it wasn't really a, a standard kind of interface where they went one place and they could get to the bulk of the resources so i mean we, we've done a good bit of work there and we did have a single sign on which i think helped but um, and, and the other thing I think we learned was we had a lot of resources that weren't being used. Um, so that, mm. I think that was a little bit shocking was while we had a lot of resources, when we pivoted, we had a lot of questions about how do I use this and how do, you know, how do I get there? And so that, again, it, it, it's a huge learning curve and, and we're not, we're not, those of us on this call, no, we're not going back. I mean, the, the positives, if there's any positive of COVID is, for some of us that have been in this industry for years and years moving in this direction, it threw us into more of a second order change, right? We've been making small changes and some districts have made bigger leaps, but I think this threw everybody into, we really need to address this. That I, I heard that more um, from higher level in this district is we got to get there, right? We know it's going to be a lift, but we got to get there. And I think that kind of pushed that conversation faster than it would have. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. Normal's not coming back. That's what everyone says everywhere we go. And we were physically down in Orlando just last week and uh, Dallas and Atlanta and Indianapolis and all of our virtual events. Everyone says the same thing. Normal's not coming back. And the where we're going this is way deeper than the teacher ranks understand. Um, all right, so let's continue on through this and have another round of everybody commenting. Um, the next sort of series of these in this can, um, I, can I just add one more thing to that? I think yeah. I think what's important to also acknowledge is, yeah, we're not going back, but there is a level of fatigue and mm -hmm. there is a level of exhaustion on all parts that even though we're not going back, we have to honor the need for a breath, the need for a chance to breathe. And yeah, we don't want to try, we're not going to fool ourselves into thinking that everything's going to go back the way it was, but we have to address the exhaustion, the fatigue, and yeah. the, you know, while we're in some regards excited because we finally got that sense of urgency that we've been trying to instill for years and years. We still have to honor that people are exhausted. They're they're fried, whether it be yeah. us on a on a leadership level or all those teachers who are sitting yeah. there going, you know, and a lot of them are leaving the field. Mm -hmm. And it's due to that exhaustion. And I think what I'd like to do is have a, look, a, a short round of conversation about that. And then I'm going to have uh, Brady, can you share a demonstration of, of one of these next upcoming items to then talk about after that? Okay, so I'm going to have Doug give you screen, but let's do a round of discussion of what you were just talking about, Jennifer. So, for example, and I hope you don't mind my pointing this out, um, the issue of the user experience, how all these systems interrelate and the navigation is preset. So the leadership level is thought through what system am I doing and where are the plugins and how is the lesson planning seamless and simple and all the clicking and everything becomes so we're super energized technology wise at this commercial grade level, right? Because that's different than everybody go build all your own lessons, figure it all out, sequence everything yourself, distribute it all yourself, get pelted with a billion emails and then answer them all. And then also the parents are pelting you with communication. That's part of the exhaustion is the digital traffic. So the think through of UI UX is a critical administrative challenge right now because otherwise you have that other thing happening. Yes, the transition. So I, so I understand we're in a curve, right? 
But what we're trying to talk about right now is how do you lead to drive that level of commercial grade understanding of UI UX that, that is the impact on the humans, right? And use your humans to their most perfected ability, which is human. Like that's all they should be being used for. Why are they building everything, right? So that's really what I, I think we should talk about. And I wanna come back to you then, Jennifer, at the end and go back to Melissa and then Tina and then back to you, is that okay? Okay, Okay. so Melissa, what are your thoughts on this workload issue having uh, a, an immediate relationship with UI UX? So one thing we noticed, you know, is the, um, when you're picking up that workload, Tina, you mentioned throwing in Schoology in a matter of months quick months yeah. and um, the teachers themselves just wanted to be able to run with it, which is fine. But when we're not taking into account that some of our users are, are looking at six, seven, eight different experiences at a time, if we're talking about a secondary student or a primary student who may be taking a related arts course outside of their homeroom course, if we aren't considering the differences from shift to shift to shift, it actually impacts the workload of the teacher. If it doesn't look the same from a math course to a science course, then you're going to have questions. Well, in math, I clicked on this and it took me there. But in your science course, I clicked on this and it took me somewhere else. Or you put all of your directions in. I noticed that um, E and J were about drop downs. Some of them, we could utilize a drop down, but do we need as many drop downs as what we're embedding into our courses? putting that pertinent information up top and making it the focal point for students impacts the user interface, impacts the user experience, but then also helps with some of that workload. If it's streamlined for teachers, we can say, well, I know that in your math class, you do things this way, because in our science class, in our language arts class, we have that same set of standards that we all follow to help alleviate some of the confusion. So we had a lot of questions that could have been eliminated if the interface and the experience was streamlined. Yeah. yeah. So thinking through that top line in order to mitigate the the workload. Okay. So coming back to you, Tina, and then Wendy, and then I'm going to have you um, wrap this up, Jennifer, and then we'll go to Brady. Go ahead, Tina. I, I would definitely agree with those comments. One of the things that we tried to do because we implemented so fast was we had our instructional technology team really working closely with our curriculum team to develop a lot of the content. So we developed a lot of content with standardization right off the bat for mm -hmm. them. And I think that helped. Um, so we had a lot of conversation early on um, knowing that that was going to be one of our challenges. So I think that was helpful. <clears throat> yeah. But you're right that, you know, kind of that standardization and looking at the various levels was also a, a critical importance for us. We have a great design big. team that does. They follow all of the same standards, but our <laughs> partner district really struggled when they didn't have a, a consistent practice across the board. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's a big deal. All right, so um, Wendy, your your thoughts on on this part of the conversation? Yeah, so I was I was hoping you would defer to me because I was I just wanted to say you know that it's so hard because. I've been there from a teacher's perspective, from an administrator's perspective, and then on the commercial side where I'm running a whole shop, right? And as a teacher, I wanted my hands in it, right? I wanted to build it all. And that was as I years ago as I was beginning to learn about online learning. But, you know, you're exactly right, Melissa. You have to have that standardization for the user experience for the students. And, and then it's a completely different profession, right? Teachers don't know about the, what colors emotions provoke and, and what the user interface should look like. And so, Tina, when you said you have your, you know, your instructional technology department that tried to create so many things in advance for the teachers, I was like, yes, because it is. It's a completely separate skill set, and teachers aren't trained to know how to design. Um, yet in many districts it just everything landed on them at one time they had to teach they had to facilitate and they had to design and and i think really you know if you go back to what jennifer said that's why they were so exhausted it's a totally different pedagogy in addition to all the different knowledge you have to have around design and and i'm fortunate to be on the commercial side where i have a separate division 
for instruction, then, then software, and then content and instructional designers. And so, you know, on the commercial side, you get to see how it really is separated, and then you bring it together for a product. Um, and, I, and I, in the education world, we just don't do that. Um, and teachers just, they just get burned out, quite frankly. So, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, we silo. Yeah, mm -hmm. we silo teachers, right? Yeah. Like, it's all on you. Good luck with your bad self, you know? It's like, yeah. <laughs> why exactly. do that? That's just, hello. Um, okay, so uh, so coming back to you, Jennifer, because you kicked off this whole round of conversation. Your thoughts now on this? Well, I've, I've been making notes, and one of the things that I think is key to all of this you know, we've talked about social emotional learning for our students and, and empathy, you know, um, and, and having empathy for the student, having empathy for the teacher, having empathy for your tech departments. Um, all that is vital. And, you know, there's dangers in trying to be so empathetic that you kind of reach to the lowest common denominator in terms of what people have, in terms of their expertise, in terms of their you know, to to cater to to kind of go to the person who knows the least and say that's what we're going to start with. And a lot of a lot of leaders do that because they want everybody to be on board. And and you know, I've implemented Schoology in one school, and and uh, one in in a very short timeline. We did it over a summer. Um, and so one of the things about that is. To be able to, you know, in terms of one of the convincing points, I guess, was we had teachers who every five years for accreditation purposes would update their curriculum maps, um, even though they were all doing different things. And, I, you know, so one of the things that I had with my instructional designers was to work with the teachers to take that static curriculum map and make it a living, existing thing in the learning management system. And to have a quote unquote class or a grade level that was devoted in the LMS to the curriculum map so that when a new teacher came in, they they were able to use that course, so to speak, as a place to get curriculum, to get activities, to get a guidance as to how their courses were to be. It wasn't a um, we talked a little bit about, you know, having something in place that everybody goes along and it's it's very structured. So there's there's a fine line between, especially with academic freedom and with empathy, between standards and standardization. And I think that standardization, as long as it doesn't, and this is what teachers will tell you, as long as it doesn't take away from the the actual unique pedagogy of different types of classes, of different types of subject matter, then it's something that, yes, it's, and it's almost like I, I use the expression tech department AI. In other words, we put as much artificial intelligence as we can to kind of run those courses to free up the teachers and the parents and the students to actually participate and think of it as something that's behind them working in the background as, a, as opposed to something that's in their face that they have to figure out. And if they have to figure out something, then that's kind of the sign that there's something that needs to be worked on. Because we always talk about in terms of these user interfaces, that it should get out of the way of what you're trying to accomplish. And the accomplishment isn't use, learning the user interface, it's learning within that classroom. And if we keep attacking it and having our users look at it and say, are we focusing on the design? Or are we focusing on the content? And if we're focusing on the design, if parents are focusing on the design, if students are focusing on the design, then we're doing something wrong. We, we need to really look at this and say, and so I've had teachers who've been very creative. And yes, the students walk into their quote unquote online class and they say, oh, I'm in Spanish now because they understand not the user interface. They understand the culture of walking into a classroom, say a Spanish class, an online class and having teachers say, welcome to online Spanish, da, 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 da. You know, it's like, 
they understand immediately and they're not caught up in trying to figure things out. And so if we can explain to our users and, you know, and, and that's, you know, I'm in the middle of an adoption right now. And one of the things I put out to my users is tell me where you're, you know, go in, play, tell me what's bothering you and, and to take my pride, my opinions and kind of go, all right, that gets shoved to the side because this is a valid issue if they're getting caught up in the design. I totally agree with that. That's beautifully said. We're going to have to quote you on that for a national, one of our little pop quotes that goes on our homepage because that was beautifully said. Um, okay, good. Good round. Good round. Um, Brady, let's talk about what the commercial grade side is doing in this space so go ahead and do some show and tell because i think that sets the stage for the next thing absolutely so i mean a lot of what you have said about consistency is something that we aim for and ease of use when when the student gets into the the curriculum into their courses we want them to easily navigate through the the, the content the curriculum the assessments and not get fumbled up with the design, just like uh, Jennifer said there um, so elegantly. Um, so here, uh, you know, we're in Algebra 1 critical concepts. You know, one thing uh, that all our courses are focused on is I in the standards, you know, contrasting elements, ease of use for, for the students who are um, colorblind. Uh, you know, we don't want to easily um, associate those students out of being in a virtual classroom just because we you know design a course that may you know affect them because of their um, color blindness um, so we look at that design we look for high contrasting colors within the lesson right um, ease of use um, another thing that we talked about i think melissa brought up was consistent design so no matter what um, lesson you're in, you're going to see the same um, consistent design. So getting ready uh, in this lesson, and then as we click through, get set, um, you're going to see those different elements within the lesson. Um, get set, go. And now if we go back from lesson one, you know, we have this, this menu up here. We'll go back to the course map. We go into lesson two, and we see that same, that same setup in the next lesson. So as the student goes through the, the course, they're gonna see and they're gonna get used to and comfortable with that format um, as they go through. You know, they're gonna get ready to understand what they're getting into the lesson. They're gonna get set and then they're gonna get into the actual lesson itself. They're gonna get into some practice here and I'm gonna find here a skill check. So they're going to be able to practice that skill as they go through the lessons. And that's going to be consistent not only in this course itself, in the math course, um, Algebra 1 Critical Concepts, but in the other courses as well. You know, you're going to get into English, you're going to get into social studies, and it's going to be under that same format. So the students can be comfortable as they go through their courses because they're comfortable with the format, because it's not different. There are going to be some differences you know math is going to be a little bit different than english or social studies but for the most part the the consistency between the courses um, allows the student to be comfortable and you know get into the content which they should be learning about versus being worried about the design of the courses and how to get through that just like uh, jennifer said and I really, really agree with that point. Okay, so thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, that we could go much deeper into all these uh, definitions of terms. Uh, but what I really want, I think we should really discuss right now is that fine line that Jennifer alluded to and, and uh, Melissa and Tina, you guys both did too, and so did Wendy. And that is, there is a big difference between teachers having to design and having that whole thing on them and, and you know the lms framework systems are great if you can do everything in there but but the scope and breadth of how much content goes out in 12 years on all your subjects is massive um so i really i really think you know one of the things that we should really address is 
our feelings about leading in the content sphere for quality UI UX versus letting. There's a lot of, of school districts and leaders who've done more thinking about their digital transition as as a lettingness, like we're just going to put frameworks there and then random apps are going to skate around in the environment um, rather than sort of getting back to leading towards a common user interface and user design, which is really getting heavily involved again in content like we did in the textbook days, right? Like we had aligned to standards textbooks that were the core and then teachers built around that. But now with digital transition in too many places, we have leadership saying, um, it's all on you. And then they go to mostly flat digital, which is documents and, you know, maybe a video and links. It's really not very, you know, interesting to kids. Flat digital is, is really a problem, I think, in the future because the commercial side is doing this so much better gamifying it, you know, little tricky things you get, you get little badges and all kinds of stuff. So I really want to talk about that, the letting versus leading, and how do you know in one subject versus another or the or the percentage that you should lead versus let? Like, how do you know this? Like, is there any way to, to manage that? I'm going to come to you first, Melissa, on that particular topic. So my, my teacher hat, um, keeps hearing you say, not out loud, but autonomy, my teacher autonomy. And when we're hearing our teachers say, we're, we're exhausted, we've had for the last 18 months, you've told me what I can and can't do, um, trying to, I think, streamline the user experience from the design aspect. But for our teachers, the way I'm phrasing this question that you asked is how can we, allow the autonomy while leading them towards the right pieces. And I think that it's feedback. When I look at flat technology, if I'm giving my students or my users a document, what are we doing with that? Is there, what, where are we going from there? And then are the students receiving any feedback from whatever it is that they're doing with this flat technology? Um, and so that's where some of those other activities, the apps, the gamified, um, even that demonstration you just showed had options for feedback built right in for students. And so when I look at leading versus letting, I think it's a balance. There, there needs to be a balance between the two, um, but leading by saying, where are we going with the things that we are letting take place in our classroom? So you're letting this occur, and then what are we doing with it? What's the feedback that's coming to your students? What's the growth that you're seeing over time? Um, it's a yeah. really difficult balance between the two. Yeah, and I, and that's why I'm asking this really difficult question. So um, coming to you, Tina, and then maybe Wendy, and um, back to Jennifer. Um, I would agree with that. Um, one of the approaches that we've done is, um, as we've worked the last several years, is try to find, I call them the speedboats, right? Those that are really um, willing to put in the effort and interested in the technology and really doing some cool things to engage kids. And, and you know engagement when you see it, right? And yeah. so we, we've, we've tried to focus and work with those teachers to get that feedback and then we've asked those teachers to mentor one or two teachers, right? So you 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 kind of got your speed boats, what I call your tugboats, and then your anchors, right? And typically, you know, if you we don't focus on the anchors, but the that tugboat will pull them up eventually if your speed boats are, you know, kind of pushing. So I use that analogy a lot because we've tried to really engage and work with those teachers that are really that get it and are doing some really cool things that that kind of pull the others along and you know when I think when teachers when good teachers see what technology can do to engage kids they get very excited I think part of the challenge is you can put a lot of technology in the classroom and if you have bad classroom management it exacerbates it and they want to blame it on the technology right and kids mm -hmm. aren't engaged 
So I think there's a real challenge, um, you know, in in that as well, and using it appropriately. And I also think, in some of the conversations we've had, is there's also we've got to find a balance, right? Because everybody is tired of screen time, and so what we don't want to do is let them go so far back that they don't use it at all, but that we find a, a balance where kids are really engaged because they are engaged when tech, when it when it works well and they're doing some creative things and i've just seen some amazing things at the k1 level where they're using ipads with carpets that make things come in 3d you know 3d dimension and interact um, and the kids get really excited and and i've seen it orchestrated um, beautifully with this teacher with kids going from one activity to the other and so it can do amazing things. Getting everybody there is a challenge. And so I think there's a delicate balance between that. Um, I do agree that we have to have a balance between the leading and letting because, you know, as a former teacher, I, I and one that adopted technology very early on, I wanted that creative ability to be able to do some things and not just the because you know, the textbook was never my curriculum kind of thing. I use multiple resources. So I think there's a balance between that and, and, and then making sure that what they're teaching is appropriate to the standards and they're driving the right things as well. Yeah, good conversation. Good. I hear the word balance again. So I'm liking that. Um, so I'm coming to you, Wendy, and then back to Jennifer. And then Brady, could you share? I think you were going to share a couple of other things that I, I want to have as a final part of the conversation. Um, Wendy. Yeah, so not surprisingly, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, and it, I think it's a great question, Leilani, leading versus letting. Um, and I agree, you know, that teachers want autonomy. Um, like Melissa said, like Tina said, you want that creativity. I, I never used the textbook, right? I, I created everything on my own and would have felt very like squashed if someone had told me, you know, you have to do exactly this. But I do think, and I love the speed boats, tug boats, and anchors. I'm going to borrow that from you. I'll give you all the credit. Um, <laughs> but I think that's where PLCs come in so handy. And, and there's so much to it that I think is professional development because a lot of teachers just don't know. And they don't know how to get to that level of engagement where, um, you know, you're doing those higher order thinking skills and you're using the technology as a tool to get the kids there. Um, and, and that being said, that's where I think you, you do the PD to show the teachers how to use it. You do your PLCs and you have your walkthroughs. And one of the biggest challenges that I push back on um, is, are you doing your evaluations with a traditional evaluation or have you created or found something that really evaluates whether or not they're engaging students by the use of technology? Um, and that's one thing Brady has been instrumental on with Edison Learning, our online teachers we're using an online teaching evaluation tool for them um, instead of using a traditional Danielson, who I think is wonderful, but it's for a traditional face-to-face -face evaluation model. And so, um, you know, once there's some accountability there as well, I think the teachers begin to step up. Um, and I think that's great too. So again, I go back to, I agree, it's a complete balance. Um, but there are things where there ha you have to lead, um, and I know Leilani, there are other standards that address this, but you have to lead around specific things like using third-party sites where student data, um, you know, where student data may be a concern. Those are things that teachers aren't trained in, right? So you have to lead, and that's where you have to be very specific about setting standards. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go a little, a little bit further and, and have, have Tina make the final comment on this. And that is the fact that, you know, I hate to point this out, but the the loss of students were over 33 percent now. 18 million kids have opted out. Right. They've gone to uh, private schools, you know, homeschools, um, home, homeschooling at, or, or charter. So a smaller percentage of that is charters than the homeschool. Homeschooling is like. 20% year over year growth rate, it's just exploding. 18 million kids not in traditional public. There's a reason for that. And it doesn't have to do with all kids want to be online all the time. That's not it at all. It has to do with the quality of the learning experience, which, which is necessarily more human, right? They're getting more attention. 
So the distribution awareness that I really want us all to be thinking about goes like this. You think you're distributing through teachers. So the entire construct you have mentally is a through teacher distribution mechanism. To, and, and tech is a tool only. But the way that the commercial side and all these people that are, you know, buying subscription sites, you know, they're for homeschooling and stuff, they're thinking it's distributed to me directly and then I just absorb it and then I get to interact with the teacher as needed. This is a different distribution pattern. This is the difference between Amazon and retail. So it's, it's we're at that moment where we have to be, when I talk about letting versus leading, that's really what I'm talking about is how do you think as administration you're distributing your human side and all the knowledge just through the tech side um so so that's a real challenge right i know i just said a mouthful um but coming back to you jennifer for your comment on that and then brady i'm gonna have you share screen again nobody so for this. a big loop so, go ahead <laughs> so it's so uh you know, I've, I've written dozens of notes just based on this conversation, and I, I don't want to repeat what a lot of people have said. And so I kind of went from the leading and letting and went to a point of letting go. And I think that's a big aspect of, of what has happened as technology has come, come about because Part of that is going back to the first part of the conversation where it talked about you know, supporting teachers. And it's not about bringing all of this content and shoving it into an online interface. And I think that's the part of letting go. What do we bring and what do we leave behind? Yes. And teachers in general and, and administrators can get caught up in this as well, of the idea of being unable to understand the difference between Stacking and integration. Teachers have a tendency of, and I, you know, everybody's guilty of this um, as a teacher of saying that they want us to do one more thing. And then there are those things that they just, the, the sense of, of nostalgia or whatever it is, you know, trying to get an English teacher to realize that one paper going away in terms of replacing that with a, with a, with a, a structured conversation in a discussion forum where they still have to do the same kind of research. They still have to, you know, formulate opinions and arguments, but it's, it, and they can still be creative and all of these things, but let go of that thing that you used to do, you know, and when you talk to teachers, it's about time. So you can talk about professional development. You can talk about having time with this instructional designer. You can talk about giving them all these things and they'll look at you and go, I still only have this much time. How am I supposed to fit this in? And how does this become something that actually helps me instead of making me more stressed? And so, you know, it's yeah. that. And then to have evaluation stacked on that and say, you know, it, it, my students are learning, but at the end of the day, you're going to look at their test scores. So whether they're engaged or not, you're going to judge me on how well they're doing academically. So you say one thing, but yet you're measuring another. So that mm -hmm. measurement mm -hmm. has to be very transparent and has to be something that takes into consideration that they're a professional and like you, they redo their classes. You know, we used to say as a kind of joke, do you teach for 20 years or do you teach the same year 20 times? You know, and I was one of those teachers who every year I had a different year because I would look at the, you know, you look at your students and your student is a different herd every year. You know, and one of the talking about, you know, and I know I'm going all over yeah. the place, but, you know, in terms of the homeschooling, one of the things that parents like about homeschooling isn't, isn't, it's that their child is the focus of attention. That curriculum can be wound around that child. You know, when we had that first few months of COVID, so many parents were like, and including our family, was like, I'm not getting anything from the school because they're not ready, but I know that I can look at my kid and know what my kid needs right now. And those things that were kind of skimmed over at school because we had to move on, we could focus on that right now so that when the school's ready, 
my kid has really good typing schools. My kid has gotten right. up to their level in terms of their math school skills. So even right. though they got a C in this and they didn't really understand this concept, now they can because I have the time to help them do that. And so it's that individuation and the, the accessibility to the tools they need for that individuation. Yeah, and I that's exactly. And Je Jennifer, I'm going to take out the mic from you. That's exactly why this leading versus letting is so important. Because ultimately the game is, and I want Brady to share screen right now, but the, the end game happening over on the commercial side is do this so well that the elevation of the human intersection occurs, which is what all teachers want. We don't want them having to build every little thing, right? But so that letting versus leading thing, it all comes back to what are you competing with? Right. And this, so go ahead, Brady. I mean, for us, you know, exactly what you talk about, a balance between things. You know, teachers aren't worried about creating the curriculum because it's already designed. It's got, you know, it's research based, mm -hmm. it's design based. They don't have to worry about that. They're worrying about feedback and how they're engaging the students. Um, you know, here's an assessment that we got here that's an open ended assessment. Um, and these open-ended assessments, all our teachers are providing specific feedback to that student. So our teachers are focused on providing that quality feedback, that touch point that really can shape that educational experience for that student. And so they can, you know, get into a conversation where uh, about that question or about that material where they that student may you know, not understand and really, you know, get that ball rolling in their educational path. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just, I, go ahead. I'm just going to give you like another 20 seconds and then. OK, we'll customization. Yeah. Kids can get in here. They can make it their own as well. Um, you know, with the the observation that uh, Dr. Oliver mentioned that we do with our teachers, you know, it's really growth. Um, pushing them to be better at the online education and how to develop them um, as the best educators that they can be. So it's a really wonderful tool that we've uh, developed. So I just want to make sure that we show that, that, that what, that's what's on the commercial side, um, because the whole UI UX conversation is around how are we going to get to that perfection of digital so that we can have a perfection of human human intersection and not overwhelm our poor teachers who we love. Um, all right, so I'm going to take back the screen and share a final thing. Um, this has been an awesome conversation, and I really want to thank you, Jennifer, for sharing and being so, uh, you know, sort of intellectual about really what you said. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted with that. And also you, um, Dr. Barrios, uh, Tina, my good longtime friend, um, great insight and i and uh i my heart goes out to you because i i see that that you guys have really come a long ways you know and and you know there's more to be done there's more to be done all over the nation um and uh melissa in place of of kara thank you very much for your insights um good comments thank you very much and wendy thank you and thank you brady um i think we're at the top of the hour now so i just want to make sure everyone knows you know come back we're going to have one more ui ux uh discussion before we edit in the dictionary we didn't get to every single point but that's okay we had the important conversation with all of you that i'm i'm sure all of our viewers are going to love um listening in on so the next activity is the focus on affordances versus flat like what is it supposed to be doing um, when you click on a button, that's what an affordance means. So hopefully you uh, come back, join us for that. But for right now, say in the